Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Admiral. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank it's a you. privilege, pleasure to have the time to grill you in front of so many people. <laughs> I'm here to be grilled. Um, we have the, the benefit today uh, of some news, uh, which I know you love to talk about. A uh, story on, on the front page of the New York Times about Iran and uh, Iran finding out in advance uh, about, or just discovering um, a U.S. effort to continue to attack its, its system. Uh, and then responding with its own retaliation, beginning in uh, August of 2012, including these attacks uh, on, on U.S. banks. For, first question I would ask is, how much of a uh, alarm, how much alarm to you that Iran was able to discover this? Well, my first comment would be, I honestly have not read what we're talking about, okay. so I'm not in a good position. Well, it's an NSA, <laughs> so it's an NSA document. I haven't read the New York Times today. If, if uh, well, uh, let me summarize for you, because it's an NSA document, uh, assuming it's true, and you can also say it's, uh, you have no knowledge of it, but the document uh, saying, and it was written by your predecessor, but saying that uh, Iran discovered a program by the U.S. following the Stuxnet virus a couple years later to infiltrate its computer networks, and that in part, in response to that U.S. effort, uh, that Iran then carried out its own wave uh, of retaliatory attacks, three waves of attacks, uh, beginning in August 2012, including attacks that targeted the US, U.S. banking system. I suppose the first question then is, that, does that sound accurate to you? Um, again, I, I, I don't want to comment if I haven't seen the specifics. Mm -hmm. Now, in broad terms, though, if mm -hmm. I could, if you want to have a, a broader discussion about, so, do the actions that nation states takes in cyber lead to mm -hmm. responses in others? I, I mm -hmm. certainly understand that. Um, you know, I, the United States, like many nations around there, the world, clearly we have capabilities in cyber. The key for us to is ensure that they are employed in a very lawful, very formulated, very regimented mm -hmm. uh, manner. I think you saw that in the president's direction to us in terms of PPD 28, Presidential Policy Directive 28, in which he laid out about a year ago so in the conduct of signals intelligence, mm -hmm. here's the specific framework that I want to make sure you use. These are the principles that I want you to be mindful of. And this is the legal kind of basis that we'll continue to mm -hmm. use. So that all remains well, applicable. Well, let me approach it differently and, and in more general terms, because the, the uh, point that this story raises, and we'll separate ourselves just from the specifics of the story, is a danger that a number have mentioned, including yourself, the idea of making uh, cyber attacks more costly in order to deter them. Uh, the follow-on danger is, if you're making those attacks more costly by carrying out your own attacks, are you starting a vicious cycle of, of attack and retaliation? And do we see that with, for instance, a country such as Iran? And, and that, of course, goes back even further when we look at the Stuxnet right. virus. So my comment would be, escalation is not something that's unique to the domain of cyber. True. So just as we have developed frameworks over time to help us address the issue of escalation, in the more kinetic, more traditional world, mm -hmm. I think cyber is in the same kind of arena. Do you believe that you have addressed it sufficiently? Uh, and for instance, this event, are there others that give you concern uh, that it leads us down a dangerous path? That everybody is looking for ways to deter. We've certainly seen the damage, and, and God knows not just Iran, countries such as China, that these attacks can cause. So you do want to raise the costs, but you also see the danger of a follow-on sort of cycle. Well, are you comfortable that we have a handle on how to deter America's adversaries from cyber attacks without creating a further problem? Um, I think clearly the concepts of deterrence in the cyber domain are still relatively immature. We clearly are not, I think, where we need to be, where I think we want collectively to be. Um, this is still the early stages of cyber in many ways. Um, so we're gonna have to work our way through this. And it's one of the reasons why, quite frankly, I'm interested in forums like this, because I'm interested in a broad set of perspectives, many of which are going to be different, you know, from what I bring to the table. But I'm interested in how do we collectively, as a nation, come to grips with some fundamental concepts like deterrence in the cyber arena. How are we going to do this? Because you look at what you see is happening in the world around us and the threats we're facing in cyber continue to grow. Mm. No question. Well, let's, let's look at the bigger threat. You, you have Iran, where, where, where there's clearly a history back and forth. You, you have Russia, source of frequent attacks on the U.S., both in the private sector and the government sector. And you have China. I spent a couple years in China dealing with this every day, where you have enormous costs uh, to the business community in the, in the billions, the tens of billions of dollars. Plus, as we know, they target government institutions and, and, and 
apparently have had some success stealing secrets. People talk about the coming cyber war, but when I look at that, just as an observer and as a reporter, it looks to me like we're already at war to some degree, a low-level war, but with these countries, these are attacks with real consequences, real capabilities. Clearly, I would argue that history has shown us to date that you can name any crisis, you can name almost any confrontation we've seen over the last several years, and there's a cyber dimension to it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's what we saw in um, Georgia, whether what we saw in the Ukraine, Iraq, the challenges associated with ISIL, this is not um, something isolated. And I think our, among our challenges as we move forward is, so if cyber is going to be a fundamental component of the world we're living in, and the crises and the challenges we're trying to deal with, so how are we gonna work our way through that? What we're trying to argue is, over time, if we can get to the idea of norms of behavior, if we can develop concepts of deterrence that lead us to collectively to get a sense for so just how far can you go, what's aggressive, what's not aggressive, what starts to trip response thresholds. You know, those are all questions of great interest, I would argue, for all of us. It sounds like you're saying we're not there, that we, we haven't even defined the concepts of deterrence. It sounds like you're saying we've got a long way to go. No, well, I think I use the word we're not mature and we're clearly not where we need to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I want to ask you, Leon Panetta, used a phrase which uh, I'm sure you've heard, uh, a, he fears a cyber Pearl Harbor. Um, what does a cyber Pearl Harbor look like? I, the way I phrase it is my concern is an action directed against, in my case as a you know, member of the United States military, an action directed against infrastructure within the United States that leads to significant impact, mm -hmm. whether that's economic, whether that's in our ability to execute our day-to-day -day functions as a society, as a nation, you know, that's what concerns me. And you've seen some, you look at what happened with Sony, you look at what we've seen nation states attempting to do against US financial websites for some number of years now. I mean, those are all things that were they, take that financial piece, were it successful, were our ability to actually as private citizens access our funds, if that were ever really contested, mm -hmm. think about the implications for us as a nation, as mm -hmm. individuals, how we would try to deal with that. Which states today are capable of carrying out such an attack like that? Well, we've clearly previously talked about, um, you know, the big players in cyber, if you will, nations that we see active. Uh, it's a matter of record. We have talked about our concerns uh, with China and what they're doing in cyber. Clearly, the Russians and others have capabilities. Um, you know, we're mindful of that. In general, you won't see me going into a, well, here's my mm -hmm. assessment of every nation in the world around us. No, I understand, but that's two right there. China and Russia already <laughs> capable of carrying out such an attack. That's concerning. Because uh, we see them. Do, do you find that they are in some of these smaller scale attacks? I mean, there was even one that went into the White House computer system, not the sensitive system, but still. Do you find that they are, well, on the one side, kind of showing off their ability a little bit, and on the other side, testing, finding the weak points? Um, I, I think nation states in great, engage in actions in penetrating of systems in the cyber arena for a whole host of regions um, among mm -hmm. the two that you've identified, um, whether it be the theft of intellectual property. I think depending on the source you want to use as a nation, we lose anywhere I've seen between 100 billion to something upwards of <laughs> approaching $400 billion a year in the theft of intellectual properties. Certainly in, in the Department of Defense, it's an issue of, that's been of great concern to us for some time as we watch nation states penetrate some of our key defense contractors, steal the enabling technology, if you will, that gives us operational advantage as a military. If I can, we've got a cyber audience here, uh, and, I, and I want to go to the cyber audience and give everybody a, a fair amount of time. So if I could touch on a couple other topics sure. uh, just out of, outside of cyber, although related to, first on the Patriot, Patriot Act with the expiry of 215 uh, on June 1st. I, I want to set aside just for a moment the privacy concerns, which as you know are, are, are severe for some, from some quarters. But and very legit, I would comment, and very legitimate. Mm -hmm. Those are very legitimate concerns for us as a nation as we try to figure out, so how are we going to strike that competing requirement for security and acknowledging at the same time our rights as citizens is foundational to our very structure as a nation. It goes to who we are and what we are. Do, well let me ask you since you, since you brought that up, do you think that the current, for instance, 
uh, metadata collection, does that get that balance right? Um, I think that, number one, the metadata collection generates value for the nation. I honestly believe that, that it does generate value for the nation. Now, is it a silver bullet that in and of itself guarantees that there will never be another 9-11 or there won't be a successful terrorist attack? My comment would be no. If that's the criterion you want to use, I would be the first to acknowledge it. It is not a silver bullet. It is one component of a broader strategy designed to help enhance our security. At the same time, we also realize that in executing that um, phone record access, that we need to do it in a way that engenders a measure of confidence in our citizens, that it's being done in a lawful basis with a specific framework, and that there are measures in sight, in place, to ensure that NSA or others aren't abusing their access to that data. And that is fair and right for us as a nation. Let me ask a question, because I'd like you to, to quantify the value that it has generated for the nation. Early on, when the program was revealed, and I was reporting this heavily at the time, the administration bandied about a figure, 50 plots thwarted. Then over time, that, that figure was whittled down by, by uh, among others, Senator Patrick Leahy, uh, to a far smaller number where, where the metadata, even down, he would argue, to zero, where the metadata itself was necessary uh, where other programs could not have accomplished the same thing. Can you identify a specific plot that without the bulk collection, we wouldn't been, have been able to uh, have identify and stuff? In a large and classified form, I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> it does one exist. <laughs> but I will say this, I, I base my assessment on the fact that I truly do believe that it has generated value for us. Now, if you want to define value uh, as in and of itself, can you prove to me that without this, you wouldn't have forestalled an attack? If you didn't have this, you wouldn't have been able to forestall an attack. The criterion, I would argue, is if you use that, then it would argue things like, well, why do we maintain fingerprints as a government? If, if you couldn't prove to me that collecting fingerprints in and of itself would forestall criminal activity, why would you do it? But we don't uh, fingerprint. I would just argue that that's not the criteria to use in this But case. don't you think there's a higher standard for this because we don't fingerprint everybody in this room. You fingerprint when you have a reason to fingerprint. In this I, case, I it's the data is collected regardless. If you look, for example, the amount of fingerprint information mm -hmm. retained for under a, a very legal and valid Global framework, entry. I, <laughs> you know. Well, let, let me ask you this then, because the reason I started the question by saying set aside the privacy concerns for a moment, because it, it is others, it's officials from inside the national security, uh, not industry, but but institutions of government, FBI and others, who are concerned that they will lose tools that they find extremely useful, you know, the tangible ability to go after tangible things, hotel records, et cetera, in the battle to maintain phone metadata collection, which they, and I'm speaking, you know, quoting FBI officials rather than myself, say, see as less important. Um, to be honest, I've never heard that argument, nor is that a conversation that Jim Comey, the director mm. of the FBI, have ever had, and we mm. talk regularly. Okay, so you don't, you don't, and other issues. You, you don't think that the, meta, the fight over metadata could hold up, particularly when we speak in the renewal or extension of 215, other more useful tools in fighting terrorism? Is it possible? Yes. Mm -hmm. my, my comment would be the value of this effort and the legal framework to continue it is a conversation we need to have in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So, what do we think? And does the program, as currently with the amendments that were directed by the president, or and changes that Congress may elect. Because remember, this is all derived from a law passed by Congress, the Patriot Act, specifically Section 215 of the Act. And should Congress decide as they look at, uh, because if no action is taken, the authority expires on the 31st of May, 2015, in which case on the 1st of June, we would no longer be able to access this data and trying to generate insights and connections between activity overseas and potentially activity in the United States. Let's remember, that's what drove this in the first place. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attack, if you read the 9-11 investigative report, one of the comments made in the report was, hey, look, you had, in at least one instance, phone connectivity between one of the plotters who was in the United States and back overseas. Hey, you guys should have had access to this. You should have connected the dots. You should have realized that there was an ongoing plot in the United States with a foreign connection. That was the genesis 
of the idea of how can we create a legal framework that would enable us to make a connection between known activity overseas tied to a, a nation state group or set of individuals. How could we try to then take that overseas data and see if there's a connection in the United States? And how could we try to do it in a way that protects the broad rights of our citizens? That was the whole idea behind it. So I would urge us mm -hmm. in the debate on this, mm -hmm. and it's important that we have a debate, mm -hmm. not to forget what led us to do it in the first place. What are the prospects for renewal extension, 215 specifically? To be honest, this is where I'm glad to be a serving military <laughs> officer. You can defer. I have no, <laughs> I have no idea. This is just beyond my expertise, and I realize it's a complicated issue. I if you lose it, that. will that greatly hamper, hamper your ability, the NSA's ability to, to thwart terror attacks? Do I think that if we lose it, it, mm -hmm. it makes our job harder? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, we respond to the legal framework that is created for us. We at the National Security Agency do not, do not create the legal framework we use. That is the role of the legislative branch and then our courts as they interpret the legality of those laws. And whatever framework is developed, we will ensure that it was executed within the appropriate legal framework. That's what I owe as the director of NSA. Mm -hmm. I want to turn, if I can, to counterterror, another issue at the top of the agenda. A lot of talk, when I speak to intelligence officials, they will acknowledge uh, that terror groups have altered the way they communicate post-Snowden. Um, and that's made it a difference. I just wonder if you could quantify or just describe how much that's hurt your capability. Um, I, I would say that it has had a material impact in our ability to generate insights as to what counterterrorism or what terrorist groups around the world are doing. Mm -hmm. if, um, I'd rather not get into the specifics um, because I don't want their, them to have any doubt in their minds. We are aggressively out hunting and looking for them mm -hmm. um, and they should be concerned about that. And I want them to be concerned, quite frankly, because I'm concerned about the security of our nation. I'm concerned about the security of the, our allies and their citizens. Um, so anyone who thinks this has not had an impact, I would say doesn't know what they're talking about. Mm. Do you have new blind spots that you didn't have prior to the revelation? Um, have revelation? I lost capability that we had prior yeah. to the revelations? Yes. Mm. How much does that concern you? It, it concerns me a lot. Yeah. Given the mission of the National Security Agency, um, you know, given our footprint around the world, I mean, us as a nation, you know, when I think about our ability to provide insights to help protect citizens wherever they are, mm -hmm. whether they be out there doing good things to try to help the world, whether they be tourists, whether they be serving in an embassy somewhere, whether they be wearing a uniform mm -hmm. and they find themselves in the battlefield in Afghanistan or Iraq today, it, clearly I'm very concerned, mm. as well as our key allies and friends. So how do you respond to that? Do you, do you develop new, okay, I mean, that sounds like an obvious question, but, but have you found yourself forced to, disc, to develop new capabilities to make up for the lost capability? Right, so, you know, to be successful, we have to be an adaptive learning organization. Mm. And as the profile of our targets change, we have to change with it. Mm. I wonder if I could turn again, once again, because I do want to give time to the audience, but, but this time back to intelligence reform to some degree. Um, so recommendation, recommendations 24 and 25, and we haven't talked about it, Frank. There's a big, there's a big news a year and a couple months ago, but it's sort of been, as, you know, as, as often happens no, in Washington. I hope you know I haven't memorized them. <laughs> no, that's right. Numbers. Neither have I. I just happen to remember, I just happen to know they're 24 and 25, but one was splitting civilian, uh, splitting cyber command, military leadership, civilian leader of the NSA. Of course, we have you. Right. You think that's a problem? No, I would argue we're U.S. Cyber Command in particular. So the specific point is, as mm -hmm. many of you may be aware, I am both the commander of the United States Cyber Command, so an operational organization within the Department of Defense, as charged with defending the department's networks, as well as, if directed, defending critical infrastructure in the United States. That's my U.S. Cyber Command role. In addition, I'm also the director of the National Security Agency. In that role, two primary missions. One is foreign intelligence, and the second is information assurance. And as given the cyber dynamics that we're seeing in the world around us today, that information assurance mission becoming of more and more mm -hmm. critical importance. So discussion in the past, about a year ago now, a little bit longer, about so should you separate these two jobs? Should you have an operational kind of individual running U.S. Cyber Command and then have an intelligence kind of individual running NSA? And should you cab the two apart? 
The decision was made at, at the time, which I fully supported, and when I was asked as you know, being interviewed for potentially to fulfill these jobs, my comment was, given where US Cyber Command is in its maturity and its journey right now, it needs the capabilities of the National Security Agency to execute its mission to defend critical US infrastructure mm -hmm. and to defend the department's networks. That in combining both intelligence and operations, in the same way we have seen in the lessons of the wars of the last decade, that integrating these almost seamlessly generates better outcomes. That's the case here in my mind. And the president, obviously, has come to that, has conclusion. Come to that conclusion. Do you think the pressure is off to some degree? I mean, you remember the pressure, and this is, this is when your predecessor was still in the, in the hot seat, but this was an enormous focus from inside and outside Washington, but people don't talk about it a lot. And we know we have this deadline coming up June 1st, but it's not the same tenor. Do you feel that the pressure is off, uh, that the worst fears and concerns have either been allayed or forgotten? I wouldn't say forgotten. Mm -hmm. I think we've gotten to a place where people say, okay, so now we have seen this work under two different individuals. We seem to be comfortable that the construct is workable, that the construct is generating value, better outcomes, if you will. Um, but if that were to change, we, we clearly have to relook at it mm -hmm. again. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm still gonna ask you questions, but I wanna give <laughs> folks, okay. uh, folks a chance to answer as well, to ask some questions as well. I know we have a microphone going around. I also know that we have uh, questions coming in via social media. I'll wait for those. Excuse Why don't we start with the crowd since you guys have taken the trouble of coming here today. Uh, if I can, well, just right, right here in the center of the audience and she's coming right behind you. Thank you, by the way, it was great. Huh? Okay. Yes, Admiral, thank you for coming. Um, we, heard, we were talking about the uh, Sony attack earlier right. and we heard that uh, the Justice Department is investigating as a criminal matter and uh, we've seen sanctions from the Treasury Department. What exactly is your role in this, you, 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 in, in not just identifying this, but do you see any action that you intend to take or have taken in response to this? Well, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of what, as a member of the Department of Defense, Defense putting on my US Cyber Command role, if you will, what we may or may not do. I think the President's comments about we're gonna start with the economic piece and then we will look at over time the potential of additional um, options or additional applications and capabilities. The, the positive side, I think, is the immediate actions. Remember the hack, the destructive piece occurred in late November. On the positive side, several months have passed now. We haven't seen a repeat of the behavior, which the, I think in part was part of the entire intention to say, hey, look, this is unacceptable and that we don't want this to happen again. That seems to have had, at least in the near term, the desired effect, although I would be the first to admit, as I had said coincidentally, just a couple weeks before I had been testifying in the House, I had said, look, I think it's only a matter of time before we see destructive offensive actions taking against, taken against critical US infrastructure that I fully expected, un sadly in some ways, that in my time as the commander of United States Cyber Command, the Department of Defense would be tasked with attempting to defend the nation against those kinds of attacks. I didn't realize that it would go against a motion picture company, mm -hmm. to, to be honest. Um. If I could just follow on, on that, during this, one phenomenon underway in, with regards to North Korea is that China has, to some degree, come around on, on being alarmed by some events inside the political structure there. How much help did you get from China, if at all, knowing that internet is routed via, North Korea's internet is routing through China, did they? Help out I mean, we, we reached out to the Ch mm -hmm. our Chinese counterparts to say, hey, look, this is mm -hmm. of concern to us and it should be of concern mm -hmm. to you. That in the long run, this kind of destruction, destructive behavior directed against a private entity purely on the basis of freedom of expression is not in anyone's best interest, mm -hmm. that this is not good. Um, and so that, you know, they were willing to listen. Mm -hmm. We'll see how this plays out over time. On the positive side, we were able to have a conversation, which we were grateful for. Was the U.S. behind the retaliatory attack on North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> Let's make some headlines. <laughs> Not going to go there. Not going to go there. Did China offer any material help other than listening? Um, I I'll be honest. I didn't work that specific mm -hmm. aspect of the problem set. So mm -hmm. my knowledge of the specifics of the PRC's response is just not high. I apologize. Okay. It just wasn't the area that I worked. Okay. Uh, be over here. Uh, where's the, where the microphone? Oh, sorry. There's one of, since the microphone's there, we'll it's go like there, then we'll try to get to the other side of the room. 
Good morning. It's David Sanger from the New York Times. Good to see you again. David, Thank how you, you doing today? Good. Um, and I apologize, I did not read the New York Times today. Yeah. <laughs> this is you know, only, me only my mother reads me that early in the morning. So, you know, I, uh, my question to you uh, goes to the question of encryption, something that has um, um, come up here recently. You saw in the uh, fall when Apple turned out a new operating system for the iPhone 6, they basically put all the encryption keys into the hands of the users and said if they get a request, either a legal request from law enforcement or one from you, all they could really hand over from the phone itself would be gibberish. You'd have to go break the code. Um, they've made it pretty clear in recent times, even when the president was out in California last week, that they plan to extend that encryption eventually up into the cloud and so forth. And we've heard um, the FBI director, uh, James Comey, um, say that this is creating uh, a, a dark hole that is going to get uh, in the way of their investigations. We haven't heard very much from the intelligence community on this. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about this whole phenomenon of um, basically handing the keys to users, mm -hmm. how it would affect your own abilities, whether or not the computing capability you're building up now is designed to be able to try to break that, right. and what other solutions you might have. So, broadly, I share Director Comey's concern here. And I'm a little perplexed is the wrong word, but the most of the debate that I've seen has been it's all or nothing. It's either total encryption or no encryption at all. And part of me goes, can't we come up with a legal framework that enables us within some formalized process, a process that I would argue neither NSA or the FBI would control, to address within a legal framework valid concerns about. If I have indic indications to believe that this phone, that this path is being used for criminal, or in my case, um, foreign intelligence, national security issues, can't there be a legal framework for how we access that? Now, we do that in some ways already. If you look at, for example, we have come to the conclusion as a nation that the exploitation of children is both illegal and something that is not within the norms of our society. So we've created both a legal framework that deals with things out there that would, uh, passage of photography and imagery that reflects um, the imagery of the exploitation of children. We've also told companies, for example, and you can screen content for that, that that's unacceptable, unacceptable, excuse me, that it violates a, not just a law, but a norm for us as, as society. So from my perspective, we have shown in other areas that through both technology, a legal framework, and a social compact that we have been able to take on tough issues. And I think we can do the same thing here. And I hope we can get past this, well, it's either all encryption or nothing, that we've got to find. So what are the levers that we could create that would give us the opportunity to recognize both the very legitimate concerns of privacy, which I share as a citizen, as well as, I think, the very valid security concerns about, hey, look, if these are the paths that criminals, foreign actors, terrorists are going to use to communicate, how do we access this? We've got to work our way through that. Hmm. Oh. Oh, man, I walked around to the other side of the room so I can get the microphone this time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, there have been reports from uh, cybersecurity analysts and from uh, uh, the Snowden documents that uh, the United States is engaged in spyware for purposes of surveillance. Uh, how significant is spyware to the NSA's surveillance capabilities? Well, uh, clearly I'm not going to get into the specifics of allegations. Uh, the, the point I would make is we um, fully comply with the law. PPD 28 provides a very specific framework for us about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And what are the guiding principles that we have to keep in mind when we're conducting our foreign intelligence mission? And we do that foreign intelligence mission operating within that framework. And that's the commitment that you know, I make as the director. Hey, we got a legal framework and we will follow it. We will not deviate from it. Um, uh, sorry. Oh, hey. he's taking the microphone. <laughs> Bruce Schneider, we haven't met, hi. Uh, wait, it's uh, the answer, uh, yes, very significant. And to the other, your other question, it's not the legal framework that's hard, it's the technical framework. That's what makes that problem hard. That's why we're stuck with all at nothing. My question is also about encryption. It's a perception and a reality question. We're now living in a world where everybody attacks everybody else's systems. We attack 
uh, we attack systems, China attacks systems, and I'm having trouble with companies not wanting to use US encryption because of the fear that NSA, FBI, different types of legal, uh, legal and surreptitious access is, is making us less likely to use those products. What can we do, what can the intelligence community do to convince people that US products are secure, that you're not mm -hmm. stealing every single key right, right. that you can? So first of all, we don't. Number two, my point would be, that's the benefit to me of that legal framework approach. That, hey, look, we have specific measures of control that are put in place to forestall that ability. Because I think it's a very valid concern to say, hey, look, are we losing US market segment here? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the economic impact of this? I, I, I certainly acknowledge that it's a valid concern. I just think between a combination of technology legality and policy, we can get to a better place than we are now, realizing that we are not in a great place right now. You know, on, on that point, it's not just encryption, but, but you speak to high-tech executives. They talk about tens of billions of dollars in business loss, whether you're talking in social media, cloud computing, et cetera. Should that not be part of the uh, cost-benefit analysis of something like phone metadata collection, et, et cetera? And now, that's not, Frankly, it's not really a question for you. It's a policy question, <laughs> a but policy I'm going to ask it to you question. anyway. It sounds like you're acknowledging that that broader impact, those broader costs have to be I mean, part of the decision. I, I certainly think we need to acknowledge that there is an impact here. But I would also mm -hmm. say, look, let's not kid ourselves. Mm -hmm. There are entities out here taking advantage of all this to make a better business case for themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are um, entities out there using this to create jobs and economic advantage for them. Let's not forget that dimension of all this, even as we acknowledge right. that it is a dimension to this problem set. Just to move the microphone around, maybe, do we have a question from uh, social media? Somebody in the back. Do we have a social media question at all, or do you want to wait? Fine, we'll wait for a little bit. Let's move it with my tune. Okay. Stretch, stretch. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick Tucker with uh, Defense One. A couple of reports come out in recent weeks about ISIS using the dark web to raise money through Bitcoin, the dark web. Uh, basically, a bunch of anonymous computers, a bunch oh, of anonymous that. users that are still able to find each other. Can you speak a little bit to that problem in terms of intelligence collection of the dark web? What does it mean to you? And, and how are you uh, going about finding a solution to some of these, uh, these really big problems of how to find people using that that don't want to be found but are effectively using it for fundraising, in particular ISIS? Well, c clearly I'm not going to get into specifics, but let me just say this. We spend a lot of time looking for people who don't want to be found. Mm -hmm. That is the nature, in some ways, of our business, um, particularly when we're talking about terrorists or we're talking about individuals engaged in espionage or other activity against our nation or that of our allies and friends. Um, in terms of what are we uh, trying to do broadly, I mean, first, I, I would acknowledge clearly it's a concern. ISIL's ability to generate resources, to generate funding, is something that we're paying attention to. It's something of concern to us because it talks about their ability to sustain themselves over time. It talks about their ability to empower the activity that we're watching on the ground in Iraq, in Syria, Libya, other places. So it's something that we're paying attention to. It's something that we're also doing more broadly than just the United States. This is a, clearly an issue of concern to a host mm -hmm. of nations out there. Um, I won't get into the specifics of exactly what we're doing other than to say, hey, this is an area that we are focusing attention on. Well, as we move, move across here, just to follow on that question regarding ISIS, because when we speak to counter-terror officials, they talk about ISIS uh, supporters here in the U.S., uh, you know, different level of the problem than you have in Europe, for instance, and certainly in the Middle East. Since the web is the principal form of radicalization for, for a lot of these, particularly lone wolves, right, the folks who don't right. travel, it must be pretty easy to track, is it not? If, if it's happening on the web, et cetera, can you identify pretty quickly and easily someone who is going down that path? I mean, it's, it's not quick and easy. Remember, mm -hmm. as the National Security mm -hmm. Agents, we are a foreign right. intelligence organization, a mm -hmm. foreign intelligence organization, not a domestic U.S. Mm -hmm. law enforcement or surveillance organization. So when it comes to the homegrown mm -hmm. kind of in the U.S., 
That's really not our focus. Our focus is on the foreign intelligence side, attempting to find the connections overseas, and then quite frankly, partnering with FBI and others to say, okay, so if we've generated insights about activity we're seeing overseas, hey, how does this tie into activity that we may or not be able to detect in the United States? And that's why partnerships are so important to us, because we are a foreign intelligence organization. I suppose, I mean, it's when those folks here make contact with folks right, over right. there. That's what I'm saying. Is, is that, I imagine it's not as easy as it sounds, it's but it must be It's not easy, trackable. but it's something that we mm -hmm. pay attention to. It's something we track. It's where we partner closely with the FBI as we right. say, okay, so we've seen this. Mm -hmm. There may be a U.S. connection here. Um, hey, this now becomes a law enforcement right. issue, vice a foreign intelligence right. issue. Understood. I think right here. Hi, uh, Ethan Chow. Um, hey, Ethan. Hi. As director of NSA and United States Cyber Account, um, do you think we're positioned effectively to address the new cyberspace as a new domain of war fighting? And how does that differ from uh, land, air, and sea? And do you think we need improvements? <clears throat> and in what aspects? So, do I, do I think we're where we ought to be? No. No, part of that is just my culture. My culture as a military guy always is about you are striving for the best, you are striving to achieve objectives, you push yourself. Um, I, I would say we're in a better position in many ways than the majority of our counterparts around the world. Um, we've put a lot of thought into this as a department. U.S. Cyber Command, for example, will celebrate our fifth anniversary this year. Um, so this is a topic that the department has been thinking about for some time. In terms of well, what makes it challenging, what makes it difficult is, <laughs> let's look at this from a defensive standpoint. And one of the points I like to make is, so we're trying to defend an infrastructure that has been built over decades, literally, and most of which was created at a time when there really was no cyber threat. That we're trying to defend infrastructure in which redundancy, resiliency, and defensibility were never design characteristics. It was all about build me a network that connects me in the most efficient and effective way with a host of people and lets me do my job. So you didn't worry about, well, were people going to attempt to, when well, we designed most of these, concerns about people's ability to penetrate those networks, to manipulate data, to steal data, really wasn't a primary factor. So there's also a component in the department as we're looking to change our network structure to something that those were really core design characteristics. Um, so that's a challenge, and then clearly we're trying to work our way on the offensive side through, so, and it kind of goes to one of the questions, um, Jim, that you had previously asked. How do we do this within a broader structure that jives with the law of armed conflict? Because remember, when you're looking at the application of cyber as an offensive tool, it must fit within a broader legal framework. That legal framework, the law of armed conflict, um, international law, the norms that we have come to take for granted in some ways in the application of kinetic force, dropping bombs. Um, we've got to do the same thing in the offensive world, and we're clearly not there yet. Mm -hmm. Where's the mic? I think just gentleman's been patient over here. Admiral, uh, my name's Hugh McElrath. I'm hey. a re retired Navy cryptologic officer, among other things. Mm -hmm. A fine man. You're and fine I man. was remarking with another colleague who may still be here. Uh, that we were having the same discussions 20 years ago. Now, there, there has been progress. There's Cyber Command. There's the NSD uh, at, at FBI. Um, but why is it taking us so long to grapple with this compared to, say, the advent of nuclear weapons and we have the National Security Act of 1947? Well, my first comment would be, um, and a guy who was a cryptologist with you 20 years ago, I sure don't remember having those conversations. Um, in terms of, can you say the, the last part about it again? You were talking about duration. Why is it taking so long, right? right? Uh, okay. I, okay. I do not want to minimize the, the, the progress. And, and your position I, I view as progress. Um, but it is taking us a long time. If it's not 20 years, then it's 15. And I, that I, compared to a much more compressed time scale for other cataclysmic changes in national security in the middle of the last century. Well, I take, for example, the nuclear example that you use. Um, you know, we take for granted today the nuclear piece is something with very established norms of behavior, well-established principles of deterrence. My comment was, you know how long it took to develop? We take them for granted now because we look at over um, almost 70 years. 
since the actual development of the capability. We take it for granted now, but if you go back in the first 10, 20 years, we were still debating about, well, what are the fundamental concepts of deterrence? This whole idea of mutually assured destruction, that didn't develop in the first five years, for example. All of that has taken time. Cyber is no different. I think among the things that complicate this is the fact that cyber really is unsettling in terms of the way we often look at problems. So if you look at the military, we often will use geography to define problems. It's why we have a central command. It's why we have a European command. It's why we have a southern command, for example. Cyber doesn't recognize geography. If you look at the topology of that attack from North Korea against Sony Picture Entertainment, um, it literally bounced all over the world before it got to California. Infrastructure located in multi on multiple con continents in multiple different geographic regions. Cyber also doesn't, refer doesn't really recognize this clear delineation that we as a nation have generally created over time about what's a function of the private sector, what's a function of the government, and how does this whole national security piece. Cyber tends to blur that because the reality is, for example, if I go to work and I'm using at work literally the exact same software, the same devices I'm using at home and my personal systems. It just has blurred the line, so that makes it very, very complicated. But I, I share your frustration in the sense that um, it's not as fast as I wish it were, but it isn't from a lack of effort and it's not from a lack of recognition. That makes sense. I think you're there. Oh, look at she's Oh, got you got her. one. She's Fantastic. Got Let's got go. Her. And we'll go cyber. Okay. Uh, thank you, Admiral, for coming. My name's Alex Tamos. I'm the CISO at Yahoo. Hey, Alex. Um, so it sounds like you agree with Director Comey that we should be building defects into the encryption in our products so that the U.S. government can, can decrypt uh, So that would be your characterization. Not well, I think, <laughs> I, think, I think Bruce Schneier and Ed Felton and all of the best public cryptographers in the world would agree that the kind of, you can't really build back doors into crypto, that it's like drilling a hole in a windshield. I've got a lot of world-class cryptographers I, at the National Security Agency. And I, I've I, talked I, to some of those folks, and I think <laughs> some of them agree too. But, so um, we agree that we don't accept each okay. other's premise, so you so, tell me Okay, there we right. go. We'll agree and disagree on that. So uh, if, if we're going to build defects <coughs> slash back doors or golden master keys for the U.S. government, do you believe we should do so? We have about 1.3 billion users around the world. Should we do so for the Chinese government, the Russian government? the Saudi Arabian government, the Israeli government, the French government, which of those countries should we give back doors so to? So I'm not gonna, I mean, the way you frame the question is designed to elicit a response in some Well, ways. I mean, do you, do you believe we should build um, back doors for other countries? At um, all? The, my position is, hey, look, I think, number one, that this is technically feasible. Now, it needs to be done within a framework. I'm the first to acknowledge that. You don't want the FBI and you don't want the NSA unilaterally deciding, so what are we gonna access and what are we not gonna access? That shouldn't be for us. I just believe that this is achievable and we'll have to work our way through it. And I am the first to acknowledge there's international implications to this. I think we can work our way through this. So you, you, you do believe that then we should build those for other countries if they pass laws? I said I think we can, can work, work our way through this. So I'm sure the Chinese and Russians are gonna have the same opinion. Sir. So I said I think <laughs> we can work our way through this. Okay, nice to meet you, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for asking the question. I mean, there's gonna be some areas where, you know, we're gonna have different perspectives. It doesn't bother me at all. One of the reasons why, quite frankly, I believe in doing things like this, and when I do that, I say, look, there are no restrictions on questions. You can ask me anything. Because we have got to be willing as a nation to have a dialogue. This simplistic characterization of one side is good and one side is bad is a terrible place for us to be as a nation. We have got to come to grips with some really hard, fundamental questions. I'm watching risk and threat do this while trust mm -hmm. has done that. No matter what your view on the issue is or issues, my only comment would be that's a terrible place for us to be as a country. We've got to figure out how we're gonna change that. For, for the less technologically knowledgeable, which would describe only me in this <laughs> room today, just so we're clear, you're saying it's your position that in encryption programs, there should be a backdoor to allow within a legal framework, presumably presu uh, approved by 
whether it be Congress or some civilian body, the ability to go in a back door. So back door is not the, the context I would use because mm -hmm. when, I, when I hear the word phrase back door, I think, well, this is kind of shady. Why wouldn't you want to go in the front door? It'd be very public. But again, my view is, look, we can create a legal framework for how mm -hmm. we do this. It isn't something that we have to hide per se. You don't want us unilaterally making that decision. Again, I'm the first to acknowledge right. that, but I think we can do this. But you want that, that ability, you want that capability. Uh, I do want to get to the back, but do, do we have a, a social, We've got a social media one. question? We have a selection. Fantastic. Why don't we do, we, we had 13 minutes ago, why don't we do a couple, and then I do, I see you in the back, so we're going to get there as well. Well, first I would just note that according to uh, the internet and some of our high profile Twitter users in here, we are now trending. So new am cyber is actually trending. So you should continue nice. to tweet throughout the conference. Where, where are we in relation to Birdman? <laughs> uh, <you> know, <laughs> Okay, so here is a selection based on the previous comment about backdoors for Russia and China. Uh, Christopher Segoyan, C. Segoyan, by the way, I may pronounce half of these things incorrectly. Uh, the question is, are foreign governments spying on cell phones in Washington, D.C.? Are our phones secure? And if so, what could be done? Did you say, I apologize, I didn't hear the beginning. Oh, are, are, okay. foreign government are foreign, foreign governments spying on our cell phones in Washington, D.C.? Are our phones secure, or what should be done? Do I think there are nation states around the world that are attempting to generate insights as to what we are doing as individuals? I think the answer to that is yes. The, the, the second question was, do I think What do you think are... we should do about it? Oh. <laughs> well, I, one thing we always do in the department, I remind people is don't, don't assume that, uh, you know, there's a reason why we have unclassified system in the Department of Defense. The reason why we have classified systems and unclassified systems, and so for DOD users, I always remind them, hey, look, we're potential targets, so make sure you're using your cell phone, for example, in an appropriate way, just as I make sure that I use mine. I mean, otherwise, you know, it's where the standards of encryption that we've talked about, again, I'm not arguing that encryption's a bad thing, nor will you hear me say that security is a bad thing. Hey, I'm a U.S. person, I'm a U.S. citizen, I use a cell phone, I use a laptop. I want those systems to be every bit as secure for myself and my children as you do. I'm just trying to figure out so how do we create a construct that lets us work between these two very important viewpoints. Okay, so that question I'm sure came partially out of the concept of encryption of commercial right. cell phones. So on that point, uh, from Russell Thomas or Mr. Meritology, what can be done institutionally to make collaboration between the private sector and the government marginally better on cybersecurity? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I think clearly I, I would second the thought. I mean, I think clearly this is an area of significant improvement. I think on the government side, we've got to simplify things. One thing I constantly tell my counterparts is, look, let's be honest. If you were on the outside looking in at the U.S. government in the area of cybersecurity, we can be very complex. We have got to simplify this. We've got to make this easy for our citizens, for the private sector, and for us to interact with each other, to ultimately get ourselves to a position where we can share information real time in an automated machine and machine way. Because given the speed and complexity of the challenges we're talking about in cyber, that's where we've got to get. And we've got to work our way through how are we going to do that. In the US government, Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security, clearly plays a central role here as both the director of NSA and the commander of US Cyber Command, our capabilities support them and other US government partners in our attempts to do that. On that topic, as a journalist, I've asked the NSA whether my cell phone communications have been monitored in any mm -hmm. ways. I submitted through proper channels, I got a response, we appealed, um, why, and we got a stock response, which others have gotten. I'm a journalist, I lived overseas for a long time. As part of my work, I spoke to people who I, I would imagine you might want to listen to, so some in the terror community, et cetera. Why, as an American, and a, a law-abiding American, why won't the NSA tell me if they've looked at my phone communications? Well, um, first, uh, if you're asking me directly, I don't know the specifics no. for you. Just, but but, but it's a policy because they've told others the same thing. So what I would say is, look, it is a matter of law to do focus collection against a U.S. person. I must get a court order. I have to show a valid basis for why we are doing that. Is there a connection with a foreign nation, i.e. that U.S. person is acting as an agent as a, of a foreign government? And yes, that does happen out there. Is that U.S. person part of a group, in this case, let's say ISIL is an example, who is attempting to do harm? You know, I have to show a court, a legal basis for the why. 
And it can't just be, well, we don't like journalists. What? Well, I wouldn't say like it. That's a, not yeah. a valid legal reason. So if, if, if so. it were to happen, you would have had to have a court order. But that's something you wouldn't tell the person who was involved? No. Okay. All right. Okay, I have one more topical question. One more, question, then we'll go to the if back. If that's possible. Uh, so from John LaPreeze, the question is based on last week's announcement or research that Kaspersky has announced that there, were, uh, there was news of firmware hacking. Has the firmware of core network routers or repeaters been similarly hacked? And if so, would this compromise the architecture of the internet? <laughs> Technical question. Jack, I, my quick answer would be no. But in terms of, uh, I'd go to the first part. I, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the allegations that are out there. I'm not going to comment about them. Uh, but in terms of, based on what I've read, does that mean, lead me to believe that the internet has somehow been compromised? No. Thank you very much. Back of the room on the left. I'm Mike Nelson. I'm a professor of Internet Studies at Georgetown, and I just recently started working for Cloudflare, which protects about a million websites around the world from DDoS attacks and provides SSL encryption. I was at the Cyber Summit the White House did a week and a half ago, and one of the topics that you kept hearing in the hallways was about how American companies are very uncomfortable sharing information with the U.S. government if they can't share that same information with dozens of other governments. I'd be curious to know how we're supposed to decide which governments are okay to share with and how we deal with the fact that the Belgians and the French and the Turks and everyone else wants to know what we're sharing with you. And our customers want to know that too. Right. So again, it's another reason why I think that legal framework becomes very important here. And now I'll be honest, now you get into the specifics of an area that isn't you know, my personal um, focus. I certainly understand the concerns, don't get me wrong. Um, but my comment would be that idea is not unique to cyber, for example. There, there's, you name the business segment, and just because we share something internally within the United States doesn't mean we do so automatically everywhere in the globe. So I, I would argue cyber is not exactly unique in this regard, nor is the challenge that it presents, and it is a challenge, I acknowledge that, to the private sector unique to cyber. We have time for a couple more, maybe way in the back here yeah, too, just another area we haven't, to be geographically fair. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Oh. Uh, listening to the conversation today, um, one thing that's fairly clear, and you mentioned it, we need to decide what the social norms are around which we build the policy and legal frameworks, but clearly listening to Bruce Schneier and Alex Stamos, and you, the social norms aren't worked out yet. Mm -hmm. So what's the process by which we get the dialogue going so we can figure out what those norms are, which has to precede figuring right. out what the uh, policy and legal frameworks are? So I, I think interactions like this are part of it. I think the interaction with our elected representatives. Hey, look, they are the ones who create the legal framework mm -hmm. that we use. So I encourage all of you, all of us as citizens, to articulate our viewpoint, to help them understand the complexity of this issue and to help them understand just what our viewpoints are as we're trying to work our way through this. The other thing that I, at least for me, I'm trying to do outreach as well in the academic world because one of the things that I'm struck by is, and, and it goes back to your question really, sir, talking about the nuclear piece. If you go back and look at some of the foundational work that was done on nuclear deterrence theory, for example, much of that back in the 40s and the 50s, was done in an academic arena. Um, you read much of the initial writings, um, you know, Kissinger and Harvard, others. There was a strong academic focus on, so how are we going to understand this new thing we call the, new, the atom bomb or the new hydrogen bomb? And so I'm trying to see, is there a place in the academic world for the same kind of discussion? Hey, how do we get to this whole idea of the, the social norms and, and what are we comfortable with? More just to, the way back here. All the way in the back. As well. Sorry. You were so close. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Leandra Bernstein, Sputnik International News. A uh, question oh, sorry, about. Le Le was it Liam, did you say? Leandra. Leandra, I apologize. Can you, I couldn't hear you after your, your voice trailed off. I apologize. Oh, I'm with Sputnik International from. News. Sputnik, Sputnik okay. International Russian News. Russian Press. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you've. Address a Kaspersky report said you wouldn't comment. Uh, there was another report 
on uh, the NSA, GCHQ, uh, hacking encryption keys in a SIM card, pro SIM card provider. Can you respond to that? I mean, you've, you've, you've said that we need to have a discussion, a public discussion. So uh, how do you, would you get that started by addressing these, these allegations? So the first comment I'd be, I've listened to these allegations for some period of time. This isn't uh, something unique per se. And again, my, my challenge as an intelligence leader is even as we try to have this dialogue, which I acknowledge we need, how do I try to strike the right balance between engaging in that broad dialogue and realizing that compromising the specifics of what we do and how we do it provides insight to those that we're trying to generate knowledge of who would do harm for us as a nation. And so it's a general matter of policy. I have just said, hey, look, I'm not in public unclassified forms getting into the specifics of what does, in terms of the, the very specific things like you've referenced, I am not gonna chase every allegation out there. I just, I don't have the time and we need to focus on doing our mission, but making sure we do it within that legal and authority and policy framework. But That's just when, the promise that I make to all of you. That is what we do. When private companies make these allegations against you, what's, can you address that impact generally? I'm not gonna get into the specifics. We've got time for one more since it's a cyber conf conference and we're trending. Do we have another Ooh. one on the web? Okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, You're ruthlessly efficient. You are ruthlessly efficient. I think it's going to take us out of trending. Here, how about right here in the front? Probably be our last one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Joe Marks from Politico. I'm not going to ask you about encryption. Um, wanted to ask about standing up Cybercom. You said earlier that you think that at this point, Cybercom and NSA still need to be dual hatted. A lot of people in the services have said that a lot of the process of building up Cybercom has been sort of shifting people who already are working in this field over to cyber mission forces. Are you concerned that you aren't bringing enough new people, new cyber experts into the military and that you're taking away some native capability that ought to be in the services? Um, the, the short answer is no. And I say that, remember, in the job before this, I was also, uh, in my previous job before these two, I was the Navy guy, so I was a service guy responsible for developing the Navy's, the Navy's cyber force. So I've lived in that service world about how you man, train, equip, how you create a force. And now I find myself as the joint commander with overall responsibility across the department. Um, if I go back to when I started in, in cyber in the department about 10 years ago, boy, our ability to recruit, retain, and train and educate a cyber workforce over time, I was really concerned about would this fit within the traditional DOD model about how we develop people, how we promote them, um, how we retain them over time. Fast forward a decade later, and I have been, knock on wood, pleasantly surprised by our ability to do that. And so for right now, my quick answer would be no. I'm, I'm comfortable that we've been able to gain access to the people that we need, that in so doing, I haven't had to strip massive amounts of capability from other very valid, you know, similar requirements uh, within the department. We'll have to watch this closely over time, though, to see if that, if that changes. There's no doubt about that. Since time's up, final thoughts? None other than um, I thank you for your willingness to uh, engage in, in, a, in a discourse. And I think it's a positive for us. Look, clearly these are important issues to us. And yet we're able to do this today without yelling and screaming at each other or pointing at each other and making acquisition, ac accusations against mm. each other. We have got as a nation to come to grips with what's the balance here. And there's gonna be a lot of different perspectives out there. I understand that. I'm constantly reminding our force, our workforce, be grateful that you live in a nation that's willing to have this kind of dialogue. Mm. That's a good thing for us. And are there tensions along the way? Yeah. It's not unique to cyber, and it's not the first time in the history of our nation we've had challenges like this, and it won't be the last. But if we really are willing to sit down and have a conversation, we can move where we need to be. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. Amar Rogers, thanks very much. Thanks, Jim. Really enjoyed it.